Hey, welcome to the first episode of the Productize Podcast 2022. This is a special season on the future of cities, the kind of cities that we want to live in. And this is also the same podcast that you have been following maybe since the early beginning, 2017. Uh, podcast for innovators, geeks, creators, entrepreneurs come to discuss product ideas. And our mission is to inspire people to impactful action. My name is Andre Marquis. I'm your host. And today I am talking with Eustas Petronis. Um, Eustas is the lead product manager at TransferGo. Eustas holds a degree in analytic philosophy and studied at the University of Leuven and Vitaltas Magnus University. He also regularly lectures about marketing and epistemology, and he used to teach philosophy of mind and theory of artificial intelligence at the Connors University of Technology. Additionally, Eustace calls himself a walkability and public transit advocate. So we're going to talk about all that today, hopefully. Welcome, Eustace. How are you today, sir? Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fine. I mean, uh, I'm in the eastern flank of Europe. So, of course, we're, you know, tracking all the activities uh, in Ukraine and, and considering what's, what, what it entails, um, you know, for us. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that's a bit stress to, your, to my daily life, you know. But, uh, How is that actually adding stress? Do you feel it on, um, you know, everyday life with people, with colleagues? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing is the uncertainty of where this is going to go. Uh, I mean, the, the, the plan, the game plan was laid out some time ago. Uh, it's, you know, it's not unexpected if you were keeping track of, uh, of uh, the regime, let's say, in, in Russia and their expansionistic ideas. Um, and to be honest, I mean, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a surprise in a lot of ways that Ukraine was first and Baltic states are, you know, mentioned as a, as a natural if not the second step, at least the third or fourth step, right? So it's an, you know, if it would extend, it would extend to us. And we are surrounded, uh, you know, by Russia and Belarus. So yeah, that uncertainty, you know, it, it causes anxiety. And uh, that's one thing, you know, personally around around me in, 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 in Vilnius, specifically in the capital city. Uh, but also, I mean, the company I work for, TransferGo, our main... Uh, our main target audience uh, are, um, you know, migrant workers coming in to work from Ukraine to Europe, right? So, so most of the people who are we serving, we're serving, and we're trying to serve even more now, are people who are directly affected by this conflict. So, listening to them, hearing their stories, or even you know our own employees who are Ukrainian, uh, it's a it's a natural daily thing that you cannot you know ignore. It basically informs our uh, operational decisions, informs our product decisions. Uh, it's a significant shift, and it would be insane to ignore it. It's it's basically the reality that we need to adapt and 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 provide the, the biggest value that we can uh, to people you know who are suffering. Yeah. Um, are you are you worried? That, how much are you worried that this is? So you you, you told me second or third stage, yeah. um, but I don't know. Are you are you confident that maybe this is going to have a more uh, peaceful resolution, or at least, or I, I don't know, maybe Ukraine actually gets an upper hand and uh, Russia eventually gives up on trying to conquer the country? I mean, there are a myriad of different scenarios now. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, I, I don't see a peaceful way out um, only because it would be, it would require the regime in Moscow to admit defeat. Yeah. Uh, I don't see that happening, to be honest. They, they went all in with this huge quasi-historical argument why this makes sense um you know going from ukraine is not even a country ukraine is not uh ukrainians is not a nation ukrainian right. not a language you know so 
for them to backtrack from it would basically require them to send a message, at least internally, that, hey, you know, this whole historical argument is basically, you know, bullcrap. And, and, and you know, um, I don't see that happening, especially when you have Vladimir Bonaparte uh, basically sitting there in Moscow. So that's one. Two, and I think more, more significantly, um, um, honestly, the guys there in Kremlin and, you know, the guys surrounding Putin basically, I think, expects West to fold first, uh, you know, for the real politique basically to come back. That assumption that, you know, West needs um, global trade with Russia playing a huge role just as much as, you know, you know, West would need uh, Russia uh, to, to perform that role. I think it's now... A game of chicken basically uh in a lot of ways like who who's gonna blink first in a lot of ways so i'm i'm still astonished like how in a lot of ways we are united as a west but let's not forget that you know for uh, for countries nations or even you know leaders outside the west the way they see this conflict they see this conflict as an internal struggle within the West, and a lot of them are congr congratulating it. I mean, it's not even a, a surprise. Like, China is uh, is uh, is basically technically supporting Russia. Like, they're not yeah, directly... Absolutely, directly they are. So they, and they really they're, watching just, the, they, they're watching this unfold and, yeah. and see what's happening. I mean, they actually have been doing this uh, for three years now, since COVID absolutely. started, right? And, yeah, I think, you know, it's a, it's a very sad story for everyone especially for us we are here in the west of europe so you know because of a geograph geographical um pure chance we are relatively far away from the conflict right as far as you can be in europe as west as you can be but still it's 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 europe and um as much as possible we should be united so one of the the the, the main topics of today's conversation is resolving about product management for re re resilience and yeah. and how did you actually start with with product management um, with your background as a you know as a philosopher student or philosophy student and then uh, becoming more of a philosopher what were your first steps that you took into product and what kind of career uh, paths were you considering in, in the first place when this happened to your you know, for year. Yeah, um, I tend to think that there's a direct through line. It's uh, again, it's I, I know it's a cliche to to refer to Steve Jobs at this point, but I think uh, you know his uh, Stanford speech basically made that point that you can connect the dots easily when you look look back. I think that I can do the same. Mm -hmm. um, there is a direct line between between philosophy and product management, and 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 one. Uh, striking thing that comes up first is the fact that what we usually consider to be philosophy is not what philosophers consider to be philosophy. Philosophy always used to be a multidisciplinary, if if you know if disciplines existed uh, for for a long time, you know, you didn't have these compartments, you know, from physics to 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 chemistry to something else to astrophysics right. or. Uh, it, the, it, it's, 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 it's the science yeah. of knowledge, right? That's what exactly. it means in Greek, exactly. science of knowledge. Yeah, so for a philosopher, it always was, uh, you know, curiosity trying to understand, uh, understandably, if you will. So, so that's the first thing, you know. Uh, the second one is the methodological uh, angle, which I think is something that people always also tend to forget. Like, it's, it's philosophy is very much logic first, right? It's, it, it requires rigor. A rigorous thinking, you know, uh, rational argumentation. It's not just you no know, po uh, poetical blabbery, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, the being of beingness. Um, you need to have a good argument. You need to be able to put up a good argument, and you learn that by reading the reading people who made the best arguments possible. You know, from uh, Heraclitus to Socrates, from Socrates to to you know um, Aristotle, from Aristotle to I don't know. Let's jump forward, Kant, right? Or from Kant to Rawls. Um, so you you spend at least four years um, in a luxury 
of just generally trying to read and understand how differently people can perceive the world um, and how at the same time they kind of use the same methods. Uh, you know, they use the same methodology, uh, which is why one of the most, you know, interesting courses uh, I took was about philosophical methodology. methodology. And then from, from there, jumping over to epistemology, which is a basic question of what does it mean to know, right? Uh, what are the components of what we call knowledge? Uh, that also, you know, is still settled on what Plato wrote uh, two and a half thousand years ago. You know, to, to know means to have a justified true uh, belief, right? And, and you have all the components there. Like, you, you can't argue if it's enough, but like these three need to be there. Yeah, you need to have a belief, an attitude towards the world, that belief needs to be true, and truth is independent from your opinion, right? We can't disagree if, I don't know, this cover is white or not. Uh, I might have different perspectives on that from you, but that wouldn't change the fact that it's white or not, right? So truth and belief, those two are, need to be there, and they're independent in a lot of ways. And then the way you arrive at the conclusion, arrive at that belief, you know, justification is something that you can measure. Mm -hmm. And when you look at these components, tell me how that is not product management. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I, I'm a strong believer it is. And, 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 you know, I'm pretty sure if Steve Jobs was, um, would be an advocate that philo every, every product manager uh, needs to be a philosopher in a way, yeah. right? Because, um, it's it's pretty much part of the job as well um if you don't have a philosophy then you're probably not going to be at least not a good product manager right you you, you need to have some some belief for sure um although you know has um once one our one of our speakers said beauty is in the eye of the beholder right and yeah. that's the subjective part of the evaluation um that you know at least for plato was also a big part if you if you you know if you refer to the metaphor of the the cavern and all this um metaphors that uh, he used to evaluate the essence of of objects and 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 truth so you eventually realized that you had a lot to do with product management or you you know you started to get in touch with digital products how was this you know because it's not so natural right i mean in hindsight i totally agree with you but if you ask most philosophy students whether product <laughs> management is a, a yeah. career choice I, I guess 90 percent will say you know what is product management i had no idea that's that's actually something people can do so how this actually happened in your life oh it's it's um it's very easy to be honest. Uh, I remember as if it was yesterday, so to so to speak, when uh, our uh, lecturer uh, took the whole course out for 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 uh, for drinks, uh, and we were sitting, uh, you know, around the table. I think there was like ten or twelve of us, and he basically said, "Guys, it's uh, you know, it's your second year. Uh, you're closing in on you know finishing your second year." what uh, exactly do you want to do after your bachelor's? A, a, right? a teacher, a teacher asked you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And teacher of what, by the way? Uh, he taught a couple of courses. At that point, I think it was modern hero, uh, modern philosophy. Uh, right. So we were going through, you know, everything post-Renaissance. Right. Um, so Kant and all the modern yeah, philosophers. Exactly. Right. exactly. Those, those guys, mostly guys. Um, and yeah, and he started sharing his own his own experience because at that point in time he also was, if I remember correctly, a general manager of a of a pretty famous and influential Baltic um, uh, production house, if you will, uh, or or you know ad agency at least to to to, to put it simply. Hmm. So he he kind of gave his own example, like I graduated philosophy, mm -hmm. I started doing my, uh, you know, bachelor's and master's, and then I started doing my PhD. And then I understood that, you know, that paper means nothing. And, and that also frees you up, because it means that your diploma 
doesn't equal profession because who the hell hires philosophers, right? There, there are no job placements for philosophers, right? So you need to build. Should. A- Some, there's, there's a point there, especially in Fair today's enough. crazy Fair world. Enough. People should be hiring philosophers to think about the world a little bit better. Absolutely. But that, that resonated, with, res, resonated with you, right? You saw it. Okay, it yeah, it, it has a point it here. Did. He pushed to build up a skill set, uh, and I was always uh, fascinated with tech, uh, from you know repairing um, desktop computers to uh, to uh, you know uh, programming. Uh, at that point, PHP, um, but then that helped me find user experience design. So I actually, you know, if 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 uh, if digital products. Uh, managers ask me like how did I end up here I usually mm-hmm. talk about UX design that I have background in there but the reason why I found that area was because of philosophy and uh, and cognitive science and philosophy of minds and, uh, and 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 that is the through line technically so philosophy to UX UX to product management carrying over all the tools and and skills that you know I've learned along the way so there, there was a push from a lecture at a very specific time uh, to settle in on a specific differentiator, if you will, uh, for a career. And then, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I found that area, I doubled down on it. And then eventually I understood that I'm more interested in unpacking problems rather than developing solutions, you know, which is what I would say product management should be, right? Mm-hmm. You, you shouldn't debate that much with the solution um, creators if you will right um, but you should define the problem area space really really clearly and this is where again epistemology and justified true beliefs you know serve me to this day absolutely so your your main position today is uh as a lead product manager at transfer go for people that don't know transfer go is an international money transfer service that allows users to transfer money online across europe and other global destinations and i guess you know at service fees that are much lower than using bank transfer services um are you actually competing with swift or no uh, no i mean swift uh, swift is a means to do that transfer it's uh, it's between i mean it's, it's being done between banks we do rely on banking infrastructure in a lot of ways so swift is part of that journey for certain kinds of transfers But, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you look uh, for something to compare us to, you can easily compare it to, uh, let's say, a bus driver uh, whose, uh, whose route is from Warsaw to Kiev, uh, you know, and, uh, and you as a Ukrainian national, you ask that bus driver to, uh, to drive, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, a bunch of banknotes back home, right? That's a competitor. Or you are competing against uh, someone who's basically, I don't know, uh, someone who's basically, you know, working at Western Union uh, and, uh, and basically has that whole model for a couple of decades, at least, you mm-hmm. know, uh, doing those remittance transfers across or cross-border transfers, simply put, or you're competing with banks. But, but honestly, for our, for our target audience, it starts with that bus driver in all honesty, right? Because our, our people are people who use us mm-hmm. are underbanked. Uh, they don't have access due to financial reasons, due to mm-hmm. uh, tech savviness, due to, you know, lack of education in a lot of ways. Right. And then, you know, out of fear, mm-hmm. they don't have access to regular banking systems. And even then, if they would, it's expensive and slow. Right. So, so you're competing against that. Plus you're also providing something that is much more faster, easier to use and, and cheaper at the, at the end of the day. But so, that said, we're shifting over to, to banking rather than just pure remittance. Okay. And what are, what are you working on? That's, do you have any specific vertical or do you have any specific? Perfect uh, segue. Perfect segue, Andre. Um, so Imagine all those 2 million Ukrainians who are now fleeing their homes and mm-hmm. moving into Europe. Um, imagine them and remember how European Union states that every single citizen within the mm-hmm. EU 
should have access to basic banking and basic right. banking entails you know depositing to an account withdrawing from an account card also yep. is mentioned there so at least basic banking services at a reasonable price to get those two million people to a bank account here are the things that you need to go over you need to have proper id or proper documents that you know would be recognized right you need to be from a trusted if you will not so risky you know environment so you do know your customer yeah, kyc and stuff like that and right. Right. lastly you know um you need to well maybe not lastly but one of the last reasons is also you need to speak the local language so a ukrainian coming to i don't know germany doesn't speak the language doesn't have a european documents right um how are they going to get that access to to a bank right so we thought that we're in a perfect position right um people who come to work in you to into europe from ukraine or from other third world if you will countries uh they use us already they trust us so why not just enhance that proposition with to create the kind of, of banking infrastructure that allows yeah, them to have the basic services exactly. of banking yeah. and, and and if you and if you're thinking about let's say value verticals in addition to send introduce hold and spend right which takes our 9 year old company into a completely new position right and uh, and so what, and is, is that it. is that what you enjoy the most about the work is that it's not just working in banking and in, in a fintech but also having this a social yeah. responsibility background to it 100% i mean uh, i could have chosen to apply to revolut right mm -hmm. but uh or to transfer wise for that matter transfer wise for that matter yeah but Uh, to be honest and i know maybe someone will listen from those companies and i don't want to demean them but i don't want to build a, another bank for people who can have access to banks but they don't want those banks or those banking services because they're basically hipsters you know mm -hmm. if i can help people uh who don't have access that's significant and 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 here's my quick philosophy right so we had multiple industrial revolutions right and the latest one to me in my mind is less about technical innovation less about capital innovation it's more about um it's more about humanity and uh, an interface innovation if you can re remove barriers and give access to something that people who are more well off already have access to if you can provide you know services to people who uh, would not even consider you know that those services could be for them the, democratizing is, to the base of the pyramid right. right you know the book have you heard have you heard about the book no no base i haven't the pyramid yeah it's in this book by this indian guy who is um i think the the book is actually called capitalism for the base of the pyramid and is basically yeah. selling this idea that you know maybe 1 billion people in a 8 billion people world are people like you and me right why yeah. europeans in rather healthy situations but 7 billion people are not non banked are out of the water system sanitation and so on so you know we should be building also for those 7 billion people and yeah. you know and those 7 billion people or maybe 6 or 5 billion people are actually Uh, also building for themselves in very successful ways and manners with uh, mobile banking systems and, and many other solutions that uh, you might have heard about. So in terms of the product job, in terms mm -hmm. of the actual product tasks and the shores and what, what, is, what is it that is, um, what are the aspects of the work that you, all, you, you are most passionate about? Is it the user interviews? Is it, you know, researching um, what what can you can you dive us a little bit into that yeah i i would never be the product manager who would say writing up jira tickets is the most exciting job <laughs> I mean, yeah me neither <laughs> yeah absolutely that's if if someone could take that over from me uh, i would happily do it 
Um, same with operationalization. Uh, I find it boring. I know people who not only excel, but are very passionate about it. But I believe in the mantra of building things that don't scale. So looking for Beautiful. looking for areas and opportunities, you know, where no one else have maybe looked or maybe maybe it's an opportunity, an area that you can carry over from a different vertical, from a different, you know, a completely different environment and apply it to an industry, let's say, that you're working in and starting to do that by deep diving into customer pain points, understanding their daily lives, defining those jobs to be done, like building that whole framework that gives you certainty in a complete uh, environment of uncertainty that's what I'm mostly passionate about, right? Mm -hmm. Building the certainty, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Getting confidence, validation. So if you had like three months of your lifetime to, to learn a relatively new technology that you're not so much uh, yeah. aware about or familiar with, which would you choose? Or maybe not just technology, anything really. Yeah. If I would have three months, uh, that's a good question. Honestly, you know, you could you could aim for artificial intelligence, machine learning. I find it boring, and there are different people who are much smarter than me who could do it. Um, I'm more keen on deep diving into you know less technological stuff and trying to build up a better context. So, for example, I would rather spend three months learning about uh, history of Middle East uh, because more and more I see that history, I don't believe it repeats itself, but, you know, leaders who make decisions, they, you know, put their hands into something very deep that we as Westerners sometimes we cannot cling to, right, because we lack that context. So if I could spend three months uh, sitting and understanding, you know, all the intricacies into you know middle east i would focus on that and not think about anything else i would love to do that and that would bring me back to my you know uh philosophy studies where i had the luxury of just reading to be to you know in all honesty yeah why, why middle east um because i don't know a lot about it that's what I found out. I've I've started reading uh, one book, um, and 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 I was my my mind was basically blown with how mm. much my thinking was influenced by Western you know history books. I'm not saying that you know the perspectives there are necessarily more correct, but it's a perspective uh, that I find you know to, to be necessary to be, necessary to be understood, nevertheless. Right. Right. Uh, it's then easier to understand, you know, why, let's say, uh, even, you know, circling back to that whole discussion at the very top, uh, why, let's say, a lot of um, nations outside Western, you know, civilization, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, find this whole thing hilarious or even funny or a popcorn show, you know, yeah. why mm -hmm. they don't trust us. Right. Like what's what's there? What's what's there? What don't I understand? And it's basically because I don't speak the language. I don't have the same shared historical context. Um, I don't have the cultural nuances, you know, um, don't get them, don't, 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 don't understand them. If I would close those, I think it would be easier to navigate and understand why, let's say, certain nations would never support, let's say, what the U.S. is doing or what mm -hmm. the U.S. is doing. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely a case for, you know, the clash of civilizations, um, you know, the, the whole theory of Samuel Huntington uh, yes. finding yes. Uh, clashes between different civilizations, but has histories is kind of, like I said, we're kind of coming back to history again. And um, and I, I guess Mr. Fukuyama's must be in, in many ways very happy or unhappy, I don't know, um, just from a, a pure academical perspective on what's happening right now. But it's not the clash of civilization that 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 is, you know, in many ways, you know, it's the same Western culture. We're all, I mean, you're a philosopher. We're all drinking from same Greek philophy, Plato, and some in, in many ways um, yes in, no. in Western, Western yes Europe, no. 
it's the same source, right? It, yes and no. I mean, um, here's the thing. Uh, the, the book I'm currently reading, I only have like a couple of, I don't know, a couple of dozen of pages left. It's uh, Mark Galeote's Short History of Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I, I would argue, probably he's one of the most prominent, you know, people who we as know, the know the history of the country, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, we'll we'll be posting those uh, those on the notes uh, yeah. of the show. Yeah, and one of the arguments he is making there is Russia as a nation, if you will, um, it doesn't have a place for Asian people. They're European. For Europeans, they're Asian, right? And 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 there is something weird there, right? They're trying to find that identity and they cannot cling onto it. At the same time that allows them to think that borders is arbitrary, are rather arbitrary. And, uh, and then, you know, they can extend them as much as they want because it's all about the cultural, uh, you know, fights against the West. So I would say it is a civilizational fight. It's not a war between Russia and Ukraine. It's a, it's a war between, uh, between uh, uh, Russian, which is Viking slash Mongolian, you know, thinking, against a more Western democratic, you know, uh, attitudes. And, you know, if you read Putin's uh, own blog post from a year and a half ago, where he basically laid out a similar argument, he spills it out exactly like that. You know, they're annoyed with the Western, uh, you know, countries uh, setting up the rules for everyone, right? Because right. most of the world, you know, don't follow them. So why should we, basically? So he's just thinking and he's betting that he'll get support from others who don't want that Western, you know, order post-World War II international mm -hmm. world-based order, right? So it is a clash of civilizations in that it, regard. Right. That's a very interesting perspective that um, you actually see it as a clash of civilizations and, and not um, within the same civilization at large but I, I understand where you're coming from and and the perspective Ru russia is actually a, a clash of civilizations in itself between viking and, and mongolian yeah. it's quite um it's quite novel to me so in in terms of still getting into back a little bit into product I'll, although i, I must say it's, it's difficult to to stay there um but but I think it's it's quite quite important just to understand where you're coming from. That one of your first product um, experiences was actually at Traffy, and Traffy they they are uh, one of the world's leading mobility has a service technology company, and they build connected mobility solutions and help people, cities, and and companies move forward uh, or move towards a more balanced and sustainable future. So. What was this? Uh, what was about this experience that made you start loving or or enjoying so much uh, mobility issues and problems? Um, it's it's because honestly, I remember when I sat down to talk to, and here's where I'm going to praise our uh, Vilnius city municipality a bit. When I sat down together with the city CTO, we have one. Uh, oh, you have a city CTO. Correct. And she's amazing. She, All right. Um, and do you have a city CPO as well? Or you uh, know, city chief CTO, product? Yeah. Right? Maybe that's completely. next step because that's what I'm yeah. thinking about. It's close to it. It's close to it. The way they are doing things actually is very close to it. Uh, I know you're 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 pushing something for. Uh, yeah, towards. I mean the the whole idea that you know I know cities that have a CTO. I didn't know that uh, you guys uh, had a CTO in the city. But yeah. tell me a little bit about it. What, what what's her name, by the way? So we can we can drop her name here on and her, her LinkedIn maybe. So her people... name is Aglia Radvilia. Uh, Aglia Radvilia. Yeah. All right. So, uh, we'll we'll search it out on on LinkedIn and, yeah. and put her uh, her link here. And uh, so was she the one that influenced you to get into product? No, no. She she mostly influenced me to look at mobility a bit differently. Uh, and, and the most eye-opening moment was when we were talking about traffic jams. And she said, look, if you want to read, because we, we were so very 
about it, right? That, oh, you know, mobility as a service or integrated mobility options, shared mobility, this will supersede, you know, per private cars and that that should remove traffic jams so and so forth. That was a topic like traffic jams. And, and she said, you know, the best way to reduce traffic jams, and I'm not going to say this applies for every city in the world, but mm -hmm. for Vilnius specifically, if, if the best way to reduce traffic jams by 30% is to fix public schools. Okay. And yeah, that stopped that's surprising. Me. Yeah, exactly. What's, that stopped me in my tracks. That? Exactly. And then and and then she said, look at the traffic jams, how 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 heavy they are during uh, during public holidays or right. during specifically Christmas uh, Christmas break or Easter break or anything like that where you know kids don't go to school. Right. And and you see a natural decrease in traffic Mm -hmm. by at least 30 percent so yeah. her conclusion is if you live outside the city and there's a school next to you where you know the kid could just walk to that school mm -hmm. um, but the parents decide to take that kid six ten twelve kilometers you know to yeah. a more prestigious school that mm -hmm. adds to the traffic jams right it and has. that opened my eyes, right? Oh, sh oh, damn, that's how I should look at these issues, right? And then mobility is the backbone of how everything is moving in the city, right? When you look at the most important areas where the city is focusing on, education, public health, uh, sports, public, uh, you know, um, uh, public communication, stuff like that, you know, mobility is mentioned as a separate section, but actually it's powering all of it, right? And all the decisions that are being made in these areas Mobility is, mobility is facilitating it, right? So what if in certain cases you wouldn't have to go to a public service or a, or, or a private service for that matter, that service could get back to you, you know, or if, you know, if you don't have to leave home in certain ways, if you don't have to do certain things, if something can be automated, if something can, you know, she said like the best thing she could do uh, by the end of, you know, the term, because she is a politically appointed no uh, person, person. Mm -hmm. um, is to have a system where when a child is born, uh, they are automatically signed up for for a kindergarten in 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 two three four years, right? If if pe if parents wouldn't have to go fill out you know paperwork stuff like that, if 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 that kid would automatically get a spot in a public kindergarten, you know that would be amazing so she started by mapping out you know all the public services that the city offers i think she came out uh, came, came to around 9000 of those services and she said we need to take a close look at each one of those and you know how how this affects you know movement in the city first and foremost right that so your your current uh, president um is um what's the name of your current uh, vilnius uh, city municipality president uh, mayor uh, Remigio Shumachos. Yeah. All right. So, you know, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But mayor. Yeah. Is that a male, female name? He, he's a male. Yeah, he's a male. Um, how how do you how do you understand his work? So I am honestly I'm very proud. It's his second term. He said mm -hmm. he's not going to seek a third one. Uh, we're a bit scared. Um, <laughs> okay. You know, because we don't know who's going to come after because all the changes that were made were made because they uh, the city established clear metrics. Like uh, and 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 I don't want to misspeak here, but as far as I remember we were thinking or they were thinking about three uh, one is the longevity of a person's life. The second one is uh, happiness index, which is a bit more hard there, but you know you can you 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 can read more about you know how you can arrive at a compound happiness metric. You know satisfaction being part of it. Um, and three, I think, was something to do about time and specifically mobility. Uh, I can't remember specifically, uh, honestly, that's my, my bad, but they came to a governmental, you know, setup and they brought metric based thinking, you know, introduced objectives and we defined the whole city strategy and communicated it clearly. So to me, it was product management in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, it, I was, it does look like that because it's very. Yeah metric oriented outcomes Absolutely. oriented 
Right. Absolutely. And data informed. I hate the word data driven, data yeah. informed uh, to the max, to be you know, honest. So that's one thing that, you know, I can mention. And, 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 and that's due to him and due to the team uh, he brought basically to, to the municipality. Including uh, Agler, you know, the CEO. Yeah, I, I think that Agle is uh, just not uh, working there anymore from what I'm looking here into oh, LinkedIn. Yeah, I, It's yeah. been a while since I worked the Trappy, so yeah, I haven't. Exactly. Uh, but yeah. what, one, of the, one of the things that you're saying you're advocating for is building for resilience. And yes. in your opinion, what is the right way to start building a uh, more product-driven culture in cities and maybe not just cities, but I, I mean, infrastructure. Yeah. And when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about mobility infrastructure, we're talking about finance and banking infrastructure, right? Because, you know, what happens when, you know, your banking infrastructure is disrupted because yeah. either foreign uh, or domestic uh, infight. So is it importing the PMs seeking to this kind of boards like city councils is is that what you're advocating for what's your perspective on this yeah it's it's a loaded question but uh but i would start with uh, saying that it's a spectrum right on the one end you have efficiency on the other one you have uh, resilience and they're in directly opposite uh you know ends right the more efficient you are the less resilient you are the more yeah. resilient you are the less efe- efficient you are right and right. Uh, and if you're trying to build something with this just-in-time attitude, right, which, you know, we all bo- uh, borrowed from Toyota, um, uh, and, and, and we basically max this out, you create a situation that COVID basically tested us on, right? Oh, okay, every, the, the whole logistical chain was based on, on the assumption that, you know, everything is going to work fine. But then, you know, borders started closing and, and then supplies didn't last and then everything is spread out around the world. And then now you can't buy stuff or you need to wait for your PlayStation 5, right, for a long time. All because the, the whole chain is efficient, but not resilient. So lesson learned, at least from my perspective, that if you're thinking about cities, you need to remember that you're not optimizing for a single target audience in a lot of ways and and mobility is a great example for that why i'm saying that because when you are introducing let's say a new way to pay for public transport right you could say a like you know there's this new technology that people are adopting called you know smartphones Mm -hmm. why not carry over everything there right right and you could over optimize for it and basically, you could have a super efficient system. You don't need to print tickets anymore. You don't need to have, you know, kiosks. You don't need to have machines. Everything's happening instantly on your phone, which you have in your I think that's what, what happened in, in Moscow subway the other day, right? When right? Uh, Google, right? Google uh, exactly. they stopped working exactly. in Russia. And suddenly, yeah. people, thousands of people cannot use the, the subway anymore because Perfect. everyone had it Perfect on their phone. example. So it's super efficient, absolutely not resilient, right? And then imagine a 60, 50, 70 year old person, so 50 to 70, right? Person who, mm-hmm. you know, at that time, let's say smartphone showing up, apps taking over the world, um, they might not even have a phone. Or if they have a phone, it's a feature phone. Or if they have a smartphone, they don't know how to use it very much. Or they don't trust at the end of the day, right? The product that they have on, on the app, right? Or maybe that the app is designed for people uh, who are more familiar with specific patterns that these people, you know, older generation, more less mm-hmm. tech savvy people um, are not familiar with those patterns, right? So you are then, you know, over optimizing for efficiency, you then create a situation where you leave people behind. Right. So if you talk about business, that's okay, right? You need to zoom in on a specific target audience, look how to you can lock in that specific audience, and then you can look for ways to scale eventually. But when you're thinking about a city, uh, it's difficult to do it. It's not like you cannot experiment, like product managers can experiment and zoom in on target audiences to explore new ideas, better ways, let's say, or more effective ways of doing things. But... Um, Running a city, and my former boss basically arrived at this conclusion, was running a city is like running a family in a lot of ways. Okay. 
right? You, 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 you can't just say, oh, I have a favorite kid, right? So I'm going to feed them. <laughs> it's at least everyone behind. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make all the counters very high because I'm a high person, right? It's easier for me. And then I'm going to leave my wife and my kids behind and they won't be able to cut, you know, the carrots or, or cut or sliced onions as easy, right? You need to find a good optimum point right to serve everyone and this is where where it's you know it's 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 most struggling so when you have that attitude towards the world and this you know brings me back to mobility and walkability and public transport Mm -hmm. um if you start from that optimum you start with trying to find basically the a position where everyone would uh in the worst case scenario would still be able to uh, have some sort of a safety net, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot have kick scooters uh, or rely on kick scooters or free floating car sharing. If there isn't a public transit uh, stop close to you, Mm -hmm. right? Because the car may broke down, the kick scooter might not work and you still need to reach work, school, so on and so forth. Right? So, Investing in public transport as the primary source of infrastructure and optimizing around it should be the priority number one, right? Walkability actually could even supersede that, right? Because first and foremost, you know, going back to what Agla taught me, right? If you could just walk to a service or or to goods that you need to get to, you wouldn't even need to rely on transportation, right? You would rely on a walkable path, right? Which would be a park, which would have a bench for you to sit, right? Or drink a coffee, you know, and, or smoke a cigarette if you do that, right? If you can optimize to, towards that, build public transport as a resilient system, then you can start playing around, uh, you know, with other means of transportation, let's say, that would eventually gradually remove the need to own one, right? But it's hard because people think, oh, it's much more efficient for me just to jump in my car mm-hmm. and get where I want to get to, um, which leads them to say that they are in constant traffic jams, forgetting that they are the traffic jam. Right, right. right. Yeah. Even Elon Musk, I think he said something about it the other day on Twitter. Finally. (laughs) Finally. He said, like, you can be the the wealthiest person in the world and the only thing you cannot... um, you cannot survive or you cannot fight against is traffic. So... Let's talk a little bit about your experience with Traffy in, in Berlin. So you shared that before COVID started, you had a project on public and private transport um, accessibility improvement in Berlin. So how did you help the city to adjust this transportation system so that people as clients could keep on using the, the software and continue to move around the city in a desired way? What was the, the yeah, trick that, there? That was... Uh... That was a, a scary and exciting time at the same at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, Big city. We, yeah, exactly. It's three million people, uh, mm-hmm. most of whom actually rely on public transportation. Yeah, Happily, transportation okay. in, in Berlin is actually great, right? Uh, yeah, it's great. Your bun works really well. Yeah, even even though you know the infrastructure needs to be updated, it, mm-hmm. it's working, right? And it it's is running, working. Yeah, it's running fine, but. Uh, happily, a lot of them, you know, a lot of people, residents in Berlin, they were able to work uh, from home. But then when you start thinking about people who can't, and especially mm-hmm. first responders, first you need responders. to make sure that they're, you know, uh, yeah, or the essential workers, right? They need to, we need, you know, as a city, again, as a family, right? You need to make sure that they are safe. So the first thing we did, in, impact-wise, I think was the most significant one, even though it didn't require a lot of effort. It was to clearly communicate the changes in COVID restrictions, rules, and routes, and, and, and recommendations, you know, within the product itself, first and foremost. We knew we have an audience. We knew that our audience rely on, on, on Yelby, in this case, uh, on the app that, uh, you know, we built, but it was branded by City of Berlin. Um, so we knew we had a responsibility there, basically, to communicate all of that inside the product itself. And it's a simple, simple thing, right? Next, mm-hmm. then you, you, you can, you know, invest or in parallel, basically invest in trying to adjust the routing engine, you know, to take into account load times, 
right uh or load amounts you know the traffic uh how so basically how how many people can be within uh a vehicle let's say at, at a given point in time which stations are you know full at uh, at any point in time right so we started investing there a lot basically to try and communicate this again inside the product when you are looking for routes which routes are the safest in all the ways so we adjusted the engine to actually prioritize what we call safest routes. And ironically, those were outdoor-based, walkable, or, you know, um, active, active active mobility-driven, you know, routes. So take a bike, take a kick scooter, mm -hmm. walk, right? That's number one. Public transport with these lines during these times, that's, you know, number two. And then you can go into, you know, more, more heavy, more mass, you know, options. Uh, so that was the second area, basically. And then after that, basically... Yelby just in general became a good go-to method uh, for people to move around the city because, oh, you know, I can find the routes and I have options and I don't feel locked out uh, because I only knew of a, you know, subway uh, going, you know, next, you know, through my house, basically. And right. there, I found the bus route now or I found a, a way to walk basically back from home, you know, in a safer way. So... Yeah, that, that those were the focus areas so ironically we had the core fundamental there with public transport as number one and then we only had to tweak it you know uh so it was again scary but also exciting uh because we felt that okay we're doing something really special here together with the city and, and you were you were doing a b testing with cohorts of specific people or were you prioritizing first responders so that they would have a better life so to say in terms of mobility or yeah. was, was that involved yeah. or unfortunately we weren't able to do that because we didn't have those data points and mm -hmm. the germans you know we have gdpr but germans have even even more stricter interpretation yeah. of gdpr so if you don't <laughs> If you don't collect a certain amount of data, then you cannot rely on it to build these, you know, tests or prioritize certain things. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to do it. Um, I don't know maybe some some kind of option on the app, just saying I'm a first responder. So, if you are yeah, that's good idea, self self declared <laughs> yeah. first responder, you could have some kind of uh, you know perks in terms of uh, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> or, so. <laughs> Do you think it is possible to expect or, you know, maybe the word is not expect, but to um, engineer dash design dash productize uh, for unexpected in advance and kind of went through it. But let me just circle back because the world for sure will. And in fact, it is facing wars, pandemics, natural disasters, climate change. So are there any uh, product tips on how product people can prepare in advance for this black swan events that are ever happening? Yes. <laughs> because um, otherwise, the conversation is always going to be efficiency against redundancy. And yes. uh, it has ha, ha, like you said if you are in a business environment um efficiency tends to win at yeah. least in the in in the short term right because everything that is not very clear to the bottom line it's it's going to be an afterthought it's going to not be prioritized it's going to be um so uh, product managers they have this fundamental responsibility Mm -hmm. more and more has with the engineering teams to also be part of this more resilient uh, mm -hmm. solutions, right? So mm -hmm. any product thinking uh, tips there for product managers or engineering teams hearing yeah. this podcast? Yeah, a couple, to be honest. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring us back to what I said before about build things that don't scale. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's where it starts first and foremost right so instead of trying to build uh, let's say a feature uh which a lot of people still think feature-based roadmaps right mm -hmm. instead of trying to build a feature for a large audience and then see minimal impact even if it's fast uh even if you can get to it fast 
try to zoom in on uh, a smaller amount of people and build out a more fleshed out experience. That will give you so much more learning, so much mm. more understanding, so much more perspective, and will make more, you more, more. You mean more specific personas or a more subset? Specific personas, more specific use cases, more specific jobs, if you will, uh, to be done. Uh, if you zoom in on those, and you know, Airbnb uh, experience is a good example of this, right? Uh, mm. That's how we launched it, right? They zoomed in on San Francisco, looked at a very small amount of people, and built out the whole experience for a small audience and then look for ways how to scale this for other markets starting whatever cities first right but then going outside us um so that's one right uh and and it's a significant shift you know in 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 thinking and you know that requires to understand that there are different kinds of product managers right you have more what you could call like visionary, more fluid uh, people who can do this. And there are more operational people who can pick this up and make it work for a larger scale because that requires more you know, nuance, more thinking, more discipline. Um, so that's, that's one, to understand who you are. And then if you are more towards that vision, more, more start with building things don't, don't scale and try to educate the organization that that's an okay path in all honesty, right? Uh, to right. operate, I, I love that. So, one building yeah. things that don't scale. The yeah. um, famous Paul Graham's uh, advice as well. Yeah. Second, second advice. is second is um, uh, a method uh, which I've learned from Michael Lewis's book, The Fifth Risk. Mm -hmm. um, so, U.S. under Obama hired the very first. Actually, the Department of Energy at that time, uh, ran mm -hmm. by uh, Ernesto Moniz, they hired the very first. By the way, a, a por Portuguese American. Really nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he so, is. He is. Yeah, good to hear that. Um, so, so he hired the very first chief risk officer, and uh, he applied a very simple method. To be honest, it's two axes, right? Likelihood and cost. Right, and you can map out scenarios on these two axes. So, for example, in in energy department, not a lot of people know this, but like they do supervise, you know, uh, nuclear weapons as well as nuclear. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Yeah, so, they are. They work as the Atomic Commission for the. Exactly. They're actually supervising the, the atomic boards uh, in, yeah. the, in the U.S. Exactly. So they 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 work with scary stuff right so so to have a chief risk officer who tries to look at resilience let's say uh is is, is critical and uh, the guy i forgot his name unfortunately but the guy basically um they basically looked at possible scenarios and said look if a guy jumps over the fence in a nuclear facility that's mm -hmm. a high likelihood situation but it's low cost right because we can catch him or we can you know kick him out that's it what right are, the, the the matrix right low risk exactly. high probability uh, exactly. risk versus probability zoom in on high likelihood high cost events first right then look at high cost uh sorry high probability lower cost events right and then you go down the list basically and this is where you can start working uh, as a future futurologist and this is where i would suggest you no know, amy webb uh, the signals are talking a book right how to look for weak signals how to understand you know patterns recognize them uh to help you do this basically prepare for this analysis to have this matrix ready and then prioritize accordingly same matrix you can apply to just pure basic you know product discovery to prioritize problems you know which should come first you can feed this in you know risk-based you know ish initiatives feed into the same roadmap, apply the same methodology, and you can then make it more resilient. At, you know, not only just efficient. Don't get to the point fastest. I hate moving fast and breaking things, to be honest, right? I, I you, can love... break the, you can break the, the, the wrong things as well. Long, exactly. Long and the guys who came up with that phrase broke democracy. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, Dave McClure in many ways was a, an advocate of that. And he also broke lots of things, including his own. Um, I mean, yeah. it was unfortunate for him, but it did break yeah. his um, credibility in, in many ways because of what happened. Um, yeah. Look, man, I think it's, we're kind of 
getting back to it, but I think it's in, in many ways an, uh, unavoidable. But what impact the current political events have in specifically in your business, we kind of cover that, but also um, is there any practices uh, how businesses, not necessarily yours, but also governments and the government of Lithuania has been doing some pranks and some hacks the, the, the last few days. Uh, um, um, uh, yeah, that, or elsewhere in Europe, uh, how they adjusted any, any specific things you want to, to go through? Yeah, I mean, the first thing uh, is, I again, going back to our mayor, I love him. Uh, mm -hmm. to death because today he announced that uh, we're going to have dedicated uh, Ukrainian uh, classes for Ukrainian children uh, and we have around 3,000 of them already in the mm -hmm. country. Uh, right. We're pretty far from the Ukrainian-Polish border, right? So for, for refugees to come here, it's... it's, it's because it's, they, they really want to, to come, right? They, exactly. they, they are trying to get there. Yeah. So that's one, right? They have dedicated classes, help them adopt, because the most important thing you can do, and I think these are the principles that I've seen the government applying, is ensure comfort, basic comfort, access to water, access to warmth, access to a community, uh, make it a bit more normal and allow, allow them to, you know, cry while having a bed and while having food and while having security. Mm -hmm. Right, rather than you know the, ba the base of the Maslow pyramid, right? Uh, Shelter, and security, yes. safety. Yes. So that's one. That's number one. And 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 this is where those classes, like you know, they pop into my head. That's number one. Two, you know, um, free free movement, basically uh, easier access. Right. Again, city of Vilnius, gonna love them to death. Free public transport. Right. So don't put a blocker for people to get from point A to point B, knowing that they need to go to a cash point to exchange their, you know, the currency that they brought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, their banknotes from hryvnias to euros. So right? don't, don't make the move pointlessly. Yes. Right? Yes, yeah, exactly. that's, that's such an important takeaway because sometimes, like you said, mobility is seen as how do I move people efficiently A to B, but sometimes yeah. the solution is really... Why should you move people, right? Exactly. It's about non-moving uh, people, uh, making them not having to go where they need to go because they can be serviced where they are. Right. Um, I'm loving Vilnius municipality more and more. Maybe I, maybe I should apply to organize the productized conference here. Please do. I mean, we have a vibrant product management community. I mean, Vinted is pretty much based in Vilnius, right? So at least that. At least you have one unicorn, uh, you know. And yeah, you, guys you know, it's that. not. Yeah, it's the entire region, right? It's uh, very exciting. That 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 actually could be one of the best stands that you nowadays can have is um, not just saying you know we are with Ukraine or whatever it is, but it's also saying we are with, with the Baltics as much as possible and we are going to double down there, all right? We're going to invest, we're going to make companies there, conferences, festivals, whatever whatever it takes really to to, to show that it's not just uh, words, it's more than that. In terms of words, words of advice, what, you, what, what kind of words would you give your younger self philosopher still in the university or want to be philosopher in many ways, want to be philosopher, product manager to, you know, advice or just words of wisdom, really. Yeah. It's going to be okay. That's it. I learned that in therapy, like it's okay not to feel okay when the situation is not okay. It's, it's normal to act abnormally in an abnormal situation. Uh, it's important, you know, to learn the breathing techniques. It's important to learn e EMDR techniques, you know, to calm yourself down. These tools, you know, war, COVID, if that wouldn't exist, still, there's so much stress that you can pick up uh, in your life to remember, you know, it's going to be okay. Um, and two, quickly, just read more. <laughs> All right. And talking about reading, you recommended a book, which I think it's super timely. Um, energy and civilization a history by Vaclav 
Vladislav Smil. Smil. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, this is a very timely recommendation. Has Europe now prepares to source gas and oil from other latitudes? Uh, is but is is there uh, any other reason why you chose it? I am a student of history in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, and uh, learning history can be boring because usually it's taught either via political, you know, angle or or a yeah. more cultural angle. Uh, sometimes economical as well, but th those are boring approaches. Smeal does something exciting. He he looks at our human uh, civilizational evolution, if you will, through a lens of energy preservation, right? The only reason why we live together is because we share resources. And the more closer we live to each other, the more we share those resources, right? Has in cities, right? That happens a lot in, in cities because that's exactly, where most people exactly. live. Exactly. And, and you can easily see the same, you know, charts seeing that the most energy efficient, you know, locations in the world are, let's say, Asian cities because every, everything is accessible very fast, easy, and they're also safer in a lot of ways, public health wise as well, right? So he goes through the very, very start of, you know, human civilization up until to this day and then predicts some stuff, you know, into mm -hmm. the future going so it's a it's it's a hard read it's an academic read uh hence why it's published by mit press mit press yeah fascinating it's honestly freaking fascinating that's a very great way to end this conversation thank you so much justus this it was really a pleasure great talking to you um it was a very enjoyable conversation i learned a lot and i'm pretty sure people listening to this podcast will has as well so thanks for joining us at the productize podcast if you enjoyed your stay give us your review on spotify podcast or wherever you're going to listen to this podcast and share this episode with friends and colleagues you also have uh, show notes and more episodes at productize.medium.com join our community at Productized Academy, and we'll be sharing the links in the podcast description. This podcast was hosted by me, Andre Marquis, with research by Evelina Bogdan, actually also from Lithuania, and sound editing by my friend Miguel Souza. See you soon. Stay safe. <laughs>